Hello, Math 200 students. Welcome to section 5.4. Uh, the sampling distributions and the central limit theorem. We're kind of getting to the crux of, of statistics here. Um, it's going to be a little confusing at first because of the vocabulary, but we'll get there. In previous sections, you studied the relationship between the mean of a population and the values of a random variable. In this section, you will study the relationship between a population mean and the means of samples taken from the population. So we're so we're finally getting to a way to get from just a sample, the data from a sample, and then how to apply that to the entire population. The correct way to do that. A sampling distribution is the probability distribution of a sample statistic that is formed when samples of size n are repeatedly taken from a population. If the sample statistic is the sample mean, then the distribution is the sampling distribution of sample means. Every sample statistic has a sampling distribution. My goodness, that was confusing to read, wasn't it? All right, um, let me try to explain this. Let's say you, let's say we had a class of 100 students and I took a sample of 20 students and I found their mean weight. Okay, then I did another sample of 20 students and I found their mean weight and I did another sample of 20 students and I found their, their mean weight and I did that over and over again lots of times. So then I have lots of different means for the different samples. And the means won't all be the same, will they? Because the mean weights of these 20 students won't be the same as the mean weight of these other 20 students. It won't be the same. It might not be too far apart, but it won't be the same. So you got all these different means from these different samples. So uh, we're, what we're talking about is a sampling distribution. So it's the distribution of all those means of all those samples. Okay, if the sample statistic is the sample mean, then the distribution is the sampling distribution of sample means. All right, which means the sampling distribution of sample means is the distribution of that I just talked about. And the mean of the sampling distribution of sample means, meaning the mean of all the means, is the mean of of the population. The mean, let me say that again, the mean of all the means of all the samples of the population is the mean of the entire population. Consider the Venn diagram below. The rectangle represents a large population and each circle represents a sample of that population of size n. Because the sample entries can differ, the sample means can also differ. The mean of sample one, we're going to call x bar one. The mean of sample two is x bar two and so on. The sampling distribution of the sample means for sample si samples of size n for this population consists of x bar one, x bar two, x bar three, and so on. So x bar one is, this, is the mean of the first sample. X bar, two is the, x bar two is the mean of the second sample. X bar three is the mean of the third sample, and so on. If the samples are drawn with replacement, then an infinite number of samples can be drawn from the population. So if back to that class of 100 students and we're taking samples of 20, but see, we're saying with replacement, so the 20 students that were in the first sample, those, those students could be in other samples too because we're replacing them. Every time we draw another 20, we're putting them back before we draw another 20. So that means you can get an infinite number of samples. You can just keep on doing it. If we didn't replace them, we could only get five samples. Take these 20, take these 20, take these 20, and eventually you get all 100. But if you replace them, you can have an infinite number of samples. Properties of sampling distributions of sample means. The mean of the sample means mu sub x bar. So mu sub x bar is the mean of all the sample means. All right, x, x bar 1, x bar 2, x bar 3, x bar 4, and so on. Mu is the mean of all those. Is equal, the mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean. So mu sub x bar, the mean of all the, 
means of all the samples is equal to the overall mean of the population. Mu sub x bar is equal to mu. The standard deviation of the sample means sigma sub x bar. So this is the standard deviation of the means of all the samples is equal to the population standard deviation sigma divided by the square root of the sample size n. So the mean of all the sample means is equal to the mean of the population, but the standard deviation of all the sample means is not equal to the standard deviation of the population. It's going to be less. It's going to be less of a standard deviation of the means of all the samples than it is the overall standard deviation of the population. Hopefully that'll make more sense to you. And the way that it is less is you have to divide the population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size n. So in my example I talked about, n would be 20. Right, I'm taking 20 students at a time for the samples. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means, holy moly, what a way, like, look at all those words. Good grief. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means, all, right, that, all that is the subject of that sentence, is called the standard error of the mean. Standard error of the mean. Lots of just vocabulary uh, difficulty here, isn't it? Okay, here's an example to hopefully help you to believe what I just said. You write the population values 1357 on slips of paper. So the only numbers in this population are 1, 3, 5, and 7. You put them in a box. Then you randomly choose two slips of paper with replacement. List all possible samples of size n equals 2 and calculate the mean of each. These means form the sampling distribution of the sample means. Find the mean variance and standard deviation of the sample means. Compare your results with the mean mu equals 4, variance sigma squared equals 5, and the standard deviation sigma equals square root of 5, which is 2.236. Okay. So once again, we have basically these values are in a box, 1, 3, 5, and 7, the slips of paper. So what's the population size? The population is size 4. We're choosing 2. So what's our sample size? Our sample size is 2. Here are all the possible possibilities of drawing two numbers. You could get 1 and 1, 1 and 3, 1 and 5, 1 and 7. You could get 3 and 1, 3 and 3, 3 and 5, 3 and 7, 5 and 1, 5, 3, 5, 5, 5, 7, 7, 1, 7, 3, 7, 5, 7, 7. And if you draw 1, 1, your mean is 1. If you draw 1, 3, your mean is 2. If you draw 1, 5, your mean is 3, right? You believe me so far? If you draw 3 and 7, the mean of that sample is 5 because 3 plus 7 is 10, 10 divided by 2 is 5. So here are all the means that you would get from all of the possible samples. Now, find the mean of all these means. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. And you will find the mean. And you divide all that by however many there are, which I think is 8. No, which is 16. And you'll get 4. Well, that's the mean of all the possible sample means. What's the mean at, uh, of, of the population in general? To find the mean of this population, all you got to do is add 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7. So let's see if we can do that. 1 plus 3 is 4. 4 plus 5 is 9. 9 plus 7 is 16. And then divide by 4, and you get six, and you get 4. So the mean of all the means and the mean of the population in general are both 4. So that's just an example to kind of demonstrate the truth of uh, what we said on the previous page, that the mean of the means of the samples is equal to the mean of the population. All right, what about the standard deviation? All right, we would just need to put all this into the calculator and get the standard deviation, but we would get the standard devi deviation to be uh, 2.5. I'm sorry, this is the variance. The variance will be 2.5. Take the square root of that to get the standard deviation, and the square root of standard deviation is 1.581. Well, uh, 
the standard deviation of the means is truly equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Remember the standard deviation of the population was the square root of 5. The sample size is 2, so the square root of 5 over the square root of 2 gives you 1.581, which was the standard deviation of the sample means. Wow, that's just a lot, isn't it? But uh, hopefully you got some sort of a background from all that. It's basically just telling us how to uh, get from the means of a bunch of samples to the mean of a population or from the standard deviation of a bunch of sample means to the standard deviation of the population. The central limit theorem forms the foundation for the inferential branch of statistics. This theorem describes the relationship between the sampling distribution of sample means and the population that the samples are taken from. The central limit theorem is an important tool that provides the information you will need to use sample statistics to make refer inferences about a population mean. The central limit theorem. If samples of size n, where n is greater than or equal to 30, are drawn from any population, with a mean of mu and a standard deviation sigma, then the sampling distribution of sample means approximates a normal distribution. It always will. The greater the sample size, the better the approximation. So it doesn't matter about the population. It doesn't matter about what statistic you're taking from the population. If you draw sample sizes where the sample size is at least 30, you're going to get a normal distribution. if the population itself is normally distributed. So whether the population is normally distributed or not, if you do the, mean, the means of a bunch of samples where the sample size is greater than 30, you're going to get a normal distribution. But if the population itself is normally distributed, then it doesn't matter about the sample size. You're going to get a normal distribution with your means, sample means anyway. If the population itself is normally distributed, then the sampling distribution of sample means is normally distributed for any sample size n. In either case, the sampling distribution of sample means has a mean equal to the population mean, which we've already said. And the sampling distribution of sample means has a variance equal to 1 over n times the variance of the population. And a standard deviation equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So that's what we've already said as well. So here's a kind of a summary of that. All right. You recall that the, the standard deviation of the sample means, sigma sub x bar, is also called the standard error of the mean. So take any weird, weirdly distributed population distribution. And if you take samples of at least 30, and take the means of those samples, you're going to get a normal distribution for those means, those sample means. If the population itself is not weirdly distributed, but is normally distributed, then it doesn't matter what your sample size is, you're still going to get a normal distribution for your means. Notice that the, that the standard deviation of this curve, which is the standard deviation of the sample means is less than the standard deviation of this curve. This curve is much tighter than this curve. Moving to the next page. Interpreting the central limit theorem. Cell phone bills for residents of a city have a mean of $47 and a standard deviation of $9. So it's telling me uh, the, the, uh, the, the population mean and the population standard deviation as shown in this figure. Random samples of 100 cell phone bills are drawn from this population and the mean of each sample is determined. Find the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means, then sketch a graph of the sampling distribution. Notice that this is not too normally distributed. It's kind of normal-ish, but it's pretty lumpy. It's not doing too great. But find the mean 
of the sampling distribution. That is extremely easy. The mean of the sampling distribution is the same thing as the mean of the population, which they already gave me. The mean is 47. No problem. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to not be equal to the standard deviation of the population, but I can get what it is. It is equal to the standard deviation of the population, which is 9, divided by the square root of the sample size, with 100 being the sample size. Let me show you where they calculated that. So all they did to get this, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means is they took the standard deviation of the population, which was given, they divided it by the square root of the sample size, which is the, means the square root of 100, which is 10. So 9 divided by 10. So the standard deviation of the sample means is 0.9. Standard deviation of the population was 9. The standard deviation of the sample means is 0 0.9. Interpretation. From the central limit theorem, because the sample size is greater than 30, the sampling distribution can be approximated by a normal distribution with a mean of 47 and a standard deviation of 0 0.9 dollars, or 90 cents, as shown in the figure. So let me, let me go back to that. So notice we went from this somewhat strangely distributed population uh, of phone bills to this really nice, smooth, tightly uh, gathered normal distribution from the sample means from that strangely distributed population. Moving on to the next page. Example three, assume the training heart rates of all 20 year old athletes are normally distributed with a mean of 135 and a standard deviation of 18. Random samples of size four are drawn from this population and the mean of each sample is determined. Find the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means, then sketch a graph. Notice that it says that we can assume that the heart rates are normally distributed, which means if they are already normally distributed, it doesn't matter what sample size I take. I'm going to get a normal, normally distributed sample sampling distribution as well. All right, so the mean is going to be the exact same thing as the mean of the population. So the mean of the sampling distribution is 135, just like the mean of the population was 135. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to be the Standard deviation of the population, 18, divided by the square root of the sample size, which in this case was 4. So it's 18 divided by the square root of 4, which is 18 divided by 2, which is 9. So the standard deviation of the population was 18. The standard deviation of my sampling distribution here was 9. Okay, so we went from this normal distribution, which is a nice, smooth, normal distribution of the population, to this normal distribution of the uh of the sampling distribution. Notice they have the same what? The same mean. But the standard deviation is what here? It is less than the standard deviation here. Moving on to the next page. Probability in the central limit theorem. In section 5.2, you learned how to find the probability that a random variable x will lie in a given interval of population values. In a similar manner, you can find the probability that a sample mean x bar will lie in a given interval of the x bar sampling distribution. To transform, you don't have to do this. You don't have to transform x bar to a z-score because we don't have to do that, uh, the table in the back of the book, to do it. We can use our calculator. The figure at the right shows the lengths of time people spend driving each day. You randomly select 50 drivers ages 15 to 19. So here's the 15 to 19 bracket. The average amount of time they spend driving is 25 minutes. What is the probability? So notice 25 is the population mean for 15 to 19 year olds. We chose 50, a sample of 50. So our sample size is 50. What is the probability that the mean time they spend driving each day is between 24.7 and 25.5 minutes? Assume that sigma equals 1.5. Okay. Let me write that stuff down here. So 
So what we've got, we've got a mean. Our mean is 50. No, 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 sorry. Our mean is right here. Our mean is 25. So that means the mean of the sampling distribution will also be 25. Our standard deviation is 1.5. So the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, uh, I needed some more room, didn't I? is going to be 1.5 over the square root of the sample size, which is 50. Which, and that approximates to some value. I'm not sure exactly what value that is. Uh, it actually tells me right here at the bottom, 0.212, but you could calculate that in the calculator. And also, I don't even need to know what, what that exact value is because I'm gonna type it in the calculator as it is anyway. Now, it wants to know, so we're gonna do, what's the probability Okay, what's the probability that the mean time is between 24 and 25.5? If we're trying to find area or percent or probability, all those things are the same. If we're trying to find that, we do what? Normal CDF in our calculator. The lower is going to be 24.7. The upper is going to be 25.5. The mean is going to be 25. And the standard deviation is going to be 0.212. All right, so I'm going to type it in. I go second distributions, normal CDF, option two. My lower is 24.7. My upper is 25.5. My mean is 25. Notice this is the mean of the sampling distribution, but that's the same thing as the mean of the population. And the sigma for the sampling distribution, I'm not going to type in 0.212. I'm going to type in 1.5 over the square root of 50. First of all, it's because that's more accurate than estimating 0.212. And second of all, because I would have had to have typed this in my calculator separately to get 0.212, but I don't even have to type it in separately. I can just type it in like that, and the calculator will do that calculation for me in the normal CDF. So notice this is the standard deviation, not of the population, but of the sampling distribution, which means it's the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size and I get 0 0.912, 0 0.912. Let me go back to here. That's the same thing they got. Probability that the mean time, the 50, so the probability that my sample mean will be between 24.7 and 25.5 is about 92%. Let's read the interpretation. Of the samples of 50 drivers ages 15 to 19, about 91% of those samples will have a mean driving time that is between 24.7 and 25.5 as shown in the graph at the left. This implies that assuming the value of, sig of uh, mu is equal 25 is correct, about 9% of such samples will lie outside of that given interval. More examples. The mean room and board expense per year at four-year colleges is 91.26. You randomly select nine four-year colleges. What is the probability that the mean and room and board is less than 9,400? Assume that it's normally distributed with a standard deviation of 1,500. Okay. Less than 9,400. Wish I could show both of these on the same screen. 
I almost can. So I go second, distributions, inverse normal, I'm sorry, normal CDF. The, if I'm less than 9,400, then my lower bound is negative infinity, negative one, E99. And my upper bound is gonna be 9,400. And my mean is 91.26. My standard deviation, okay, I want to, I really want to get something clear here. If they're asking you, what is the probability that a particular college is less than 9,400, then you would put in the standard deviation of the population. But that's not what they're asking. They're asking, what is the probability that the mean room and board of the sample is less than 9400 so if, if they're talking about the mean of an individual thing what if, if they're find, trying to find that what was probably that the uh that a, a, a particular individual thing is this value then we use the standard deviation of the population but if they ask what is the probability that the mean of the sample is this particular value then we don't use the mean of the population we use this little formula here. We use the mean, the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So the square root of nine in this case, since the said I selected nine colleges. I could put square root of nine, or I could, if you wanted to just put, well, the square root of nine is three, so if you just want to put three instead of the square root of nine, that would be the same thing. And that gives me 0 0.7082. So close to 71% chance that uh, the, the, the mean value of my sample of nine colleges will be less than $9,400. Moving to the next page. Example six, the average credit card debt carried by undergraduates is normally distributed with a mean of 3173 and standard deviation 1120. What is the probability that a randomly selected undergraduate who is a credit card holder has a credit card balance less than 2700? Again, we know the mean, we know uh, less than 2700 means we, our lower bound is gonna be negative infinity, our upper bound is gonna be 2700, but what should we use for the standard deviation? That's the question here. That's where you're going to get problems right or wrong is if should you use the standard deviation of the population or should you use the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Notice what the question asks. What is the probability that a randomly selected undergraduate? So we're talking about one person. We're not talking about a sample of people. We're talking about one individual thing, which means we're going to use the standard deviation of the population in this part one. So uh, go second distributions normal CDF. Uh, we're talking about being less than 2700 so negative 1 E99 for my lower 2700 for my upper. My mean was 3173. My standard deviation is just 1120. It's the standard deviation of the population. And that's going to give me the answer. 0.3364. That's, that's it. The probability that the randomly selected person has a credit card balance less than 2700 is about 30 four percent next part you randomly select 25 undergraduates who are credit card holders now you're talking about not one person but a sample of people what is the probability that their mean credit card balance is less than 2700 so everything i just did will be the same normal cdf Negative 189, 99, 2700, means still the same. The standard deviation, I'm not going to use the standard deviation of the population here. I'm going to divide that by the 
square root of the sample size. In this case, it's the square root of 25, or I could have just put five. All right, and I'm gonna paste that and calculate it, and it is 0 0.0174. So the probability that any one person had a credit card balance less than 2,700 was about 34%, but the probability that a mean of 25 people was less than 2,700 is less than 2%. It's much more likely to find just one individual that's going to be kind of an outlier than it would be to find the mean of a whole, the mean of a whole sample to be an outlier. Compare the probabilities from one and two. We just did that. In fact, we would say number one would not be an unusual event because it was like 34% or something. But number two, having a, about a 2% chance or less than 2% chance would be considered an unusual event. And that does it for section 5.4. Good luck on that assignment. I'll see you again in 5.5.